Thank you, Francis. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to um, the biennial lecture, the Thomas Sharp Memorial Lecture. Um, we're very, very privileged this evening to welcome director and um, broadcaster Gillian Darley. And I'd also like to extend a very special welcome to John Mapplebeck. John um, worked with uh, films uh, with, with um, Nairn in the uh, 60s, and uh, we're hoping that John might make a few comments as well um, this evening. Now, Gillian doesn't actually know this, because uh, I haven't told her, but uh, before, I was, uh, before I became an academic, I was a conservation officer um, I was working in, North, uh, in uh, West Yorkshire, and in particular, um, an area called Saltaire. For those of you who don't know Saltaire, it's a mid-19th century uh, model industrial settlement, and um, it's actually a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site these days. And uh, one day I was in the bookshop of Saltaire, and I noticed a book called Villages of Vision. Uh, Villages of Vision is a book which uh, basically outlines the history of um, settlements like Saltaire, and it was written by Gillian. Gillian, I'm just trying to do the kind of maths in my head, and uh, I think you must have been incredibly young when you wrote that, <laughs> that book, because it's quite, quite some time ago. Um, anyway, I, I, went to, I, I, I went back to my boss and said, uh, I think this is a really useful book. Can we buy it for our library? We have a library of texts um, in the office. And he said, uh, yes, no problem, and, and we got it. And, um, well, in the old days when working people had things called coffee breaks and uh, dinner hours and, and, and so on, I managed to actually read this book and I found it incredibly interesting and um, I could say indeed inspirational. And it got me thinking that maybe rather than spending my days arguing with Yorkshire builders over the right consistency of lime mortar and the proper profile of bucket handle pointing, um, it might be more interesting if I spent my days reading interesting books and articles and having interesting <coughs> thoughts and maybe passing those on to, to, to others. You can see I had a very rosy kind of picture of what an academic life might be like. Um, so it's not been quite that way, but never mind. Um, I've never looked back, Gillian, and uh, I have to say, in part, I have you to thank for that. And uh, one could say, perhaps I was inspired by Gillian. I know Gillian was inspired by Nairn. Nairn was inspired by Newcastle. So I guess there's been an awful lot of inspiration going on. So, ladies and gentlemen, Gillian Darley. sheer excitement. The view that stops you dead halfway down the street, or the flight of steps that sucks you in like a vortex. Too few people know about it. Fewer still understand just why the Newcastle pattern is so marvellous. And then he says, too many, sorry, <laughs> too many um, superlatives. I don't think so. <coughs> By 1960, Ian Nairn had hit his stride, and this quote is from one of his articles in the BBC's weekly magazine, The Listener, and um, I put it up on screen, I apologise, it's the best you can do from photocopies. In all but the strictly factual sense, Ian Nairn was a son of Newcastle. He once described himself as a Jarrow man at one remove, but he was actually... He was actually born in Bedford, but that is his death certificate. And you will notice that on the line which says date and place of birth, it says Newcastle. <laughs> so he was that much of a Newcastle boy. He was born in Bedford in late August 1930, six weeks before the R101 crashed, which brought to an end his, career, his father's career as a draftsman in the Cardington um, sheds as well, of course, as the end of the development of British airships in general. The family, Nan was an only child, I think you can tell from what I'm going to tell you, moved south into the drab, pine-girt, Surrey suburbs of Frimley. For those of you who don't know or have forgotten the name or writings of Ian Nan, I'm going to introduce him. 
Forgive me if I have some length, because there's a lot to say. After studying mathematics at Birmingham, he spent a short period as an RAF flying officer stationed near Norwich, piloting meteors around North Norfolk and keeping a weather eye out for lost buildings by John Soane, he reported back to Dorothy Stroud at the Soane Museum on his findings. By the time he'd handed in his pilot's license in 1966, he estimated he'd clocked up a thousand hours of flying time. The air was his element. On the ground, Nan was a relentless autodidact, a voracious reader, film, and concert goer. And in many ways, he was a young man after Kingsley Amos' Lucky Jim, one of his favourite books. He was a grammar school boy from the Red Brick University. He even had a fiancée, Joan. She turned out to work at the RIBA library some years later, but by then she was called Elizabeth. I'm sure that was Nan's choice. And their marriage was by then foundry. The picture on the screen, in fact, shows him uh, 1956, so um, a couple of years after we're, uh, which we're speaking. Though brought up in the home counties and educated in the Midlands, as a topographer of poetic sensibility, Nairn yearned to be a northerner and authentically working class. He reveled in cinematic social realism, such as the loneliness of the long distance runner, and he always talked of Newcastle. He never shortened his A's in any other word, just the Newcastle. His first piece, published in the Architectural Review, this is the first piece he ever published, was in 1953, and it was a review, neatly enough for our purposes, of Thomas Sharp's Oxford Observed. Sharp, wrote Nairn, was writing about a new art, townscape, and I quote, the analysis of the appearance of a city in the true terms of the English picturesque tradition. Although he considered Sharp underplayed the key role of architecture, especially in the context of Oxford, Nairn was demonstrably keen to set out his own stall in front of the AR edu ed editors. I'm going to say AR for Architectural Review, so that's the way he worked. The townscape was in fact their creation. And his article, seen with hindsight, was truly a job application. He wrote in the review, a, tu a truly organic idea of townscape needs a poet to integrate and not a scholarly guide to analyse. Nan embarked with confidence, for all that he'd hardly turned 23 and was still in the RAF, though now stationed in Sutton Coldfield and awaiting release. Sharp, brought up in the mining villages of County Durham, was almost 30 years Nan's senior and was now ending the, nearing the end of his career after a succession of professional disappointments, latterly his failure uh, to be given a permanent role at Corley Newtown. Sharp's literary references came rather jarringly, from D.H. Lawrence, Nairns came from T.H. Th, sorry, T.S. Eliot, and even Jack Kerouac. Everything, each, sorry, each was everything the other wasn't. By early 1954, Ian Nairn was becoming a familiar figure around Queen Anne's Gate. Queen Anne's Gate being just behind, um, as it were, the photographer in this picture. These were the offices of the architectural press, and dressed in his dyed Air Force great coat. Nairn just used to keep turning up. That March, he sent Nicholas Pesner a list of additions to two forthcoming volumes of the recently launched Buildings of England series, and they were for the City of London and for Northumberland. These, unfortunately, have not survived, but the addenda were gleaned, he admitted, chiefly from the DNB. Pesner referred to them, I think probably slightly slightingly, as wads, and, um, <coughs> and thought they looked eminently promising. Nan also told the president that he was now in London and would be very grateful for any work he might be able to give me. <coughs> Two suggestions, he says in the letter, I dare not make to you in person, were either that he, Nan, write descriptions of the less interest, interesting buildings in each county or take on one of the home counties, say Surrey, which I know well and has no outstandingly significant buildings. <laughs> Pesno replied, saying he still hoped to do the lot himself, unless, he said, he might hand on a whole volume to someone like Hoskins, that's W.G. Hoskins. By mid-1954, mid Nairn's name was, however, on the masthead of the Architectural Review, so here he is. Uh, and he'd obviously been already working there for the editors, because the end of the same letter I was just quoting from Pevsner says, you seem to be very successful in your work on the outrage. I don't know why 
if it's a typo or if it actually was called out right at the time, number. And I don't think myself you need worry about a continuation of work for the review. In the summer of 1955, the AR launched Outrage, a series of high, highly polemical articles soon published in book form. The candidate was given style and punch by the visualizations of Gordon Cullen, <coughs> cover, uh, I think gives you a sense of that, and the distinctive radical graphics. And the cover, um, you can probably notice quite quickly, is, as it were, through uh, the rear view mirror of the car. The aim, and I quote, was to expose the mess of under-designed, ill-planned squalor, fast moving up towns through, literally, the length of England from Southampton to Carlisle. It's the greatest indictment yet published of the 20th century's inability to handle the visual implications of the complex technology it's created. Outrage and incorrect landscape it conjured up, which became known as Subtopia, was discussed in leading articles in the Times and the Manchester Guardian, and even by Cassandra, the popular Daily Mail columnist. Further, Flash from Subtopia was going to be a regular feature on Gilbert Harding's new TV program, Harding Finds Out. Hugh Casson, who where the media was concerned, was still bathed in the afterglow of the Festival of Britain, had been given the unhappy task of <coughs> sketching the viewers' choices of outrage online, I mean live, sorry, I should say, um, on the basis of a handful of photographs and a blackboard. For all Casson's wit and dexterity, it can't have made very compelling television, even in 1955. Subtopia was everywhere, on everyone's lips, and even those of the young Duke of Edinburgh. Nairn had become an overnight success, oxygenated by his new life in the spotlight. Sharp's English Panorama, which came out in 1936, but was reissued by the architectural press in 1950, had included a chapter on universal suburbia, and invoked the conservationist Sir George Stapledon's The Land, whose words, and I quote, it is an outrage on posterity to misuse a single yard of land, had provided the title of the campaign. But Sharp's term, Motorville, had not had the ring of subtopia, and nor did he have the qualities to attract the patronage of the editor and proprietor of the AR, <coughs> the extraordinary Hubert de Crillon Hastings, also known as either the Wolf or even either the Waffle as Nairn did. Nairn was um, extensively patronised by um, the wolf. <coughs> Sharp found that a new generation of ambitious novices set little store by his insights or experience in the world of planning. And perhaps he lashed out, <coughs> because when discussing who should review his Your England Revi Revisited on the radio some years later, Nairn retaliated. Might the BBC like to approach his choices were Sid Chaplin, the novelist, or, if not, an intelligent, non-you teenager, or anyone except Thomas Sharp? <laughs> and that's, I'm afraid, where we leave Thomas Sharp for these purposes. An outrage to, a, a sequel to Outrage was published in 1956, which was called County Blast, edited by Nairn, who now signed his letters over a rubber stamp which proclaimed the Counterblast Bureau. From overseas, it may have seen a more substantial affair than reality, which was Nairn's desk. The following year, he was invited on the whistle-stop tour of major, Europe, of major American cities, courtesy of Time Life, Inc. And his and Cullen's illustrations, taken from his photographs, were published in an article and then a book, The, the Exploding Metropolis. On the strength of this, the Rockefeller Foundation funded him to take a 10-week road trip in 1952 Plymouth, Plymouth Softop. He really loved cars. It cost him two, $250, but he spent a lot of money on it too. The trip um, became eventually, and it was a long time later, uh, a book called The American Landscape, A Critical View. And those are two uh, images from it. Um, all the photographs in the book are his. Uh, on the left, a streetscape in Boston, much admired, and on the right, a sort of typical um, semi, uh, an American subtopia in a way, uh, you possibly can't read, it says, welcome to New Hampshire, land of scenic splendor. <laughs> on his return, writing an encounter, 
the cultural ma magazine later revealed to have been funded by the CIA, he criticized zoning, arguing that London only became first rate by accident. Southwark Cathedral jammed next to Southwark warehouses, epitomizing organic accretion from functional and economic reasons, not an applied and artificial external direction. In the USA, the gridiron had stunted the pattern of 99 cities and made the hundredth, San Francisco, into a masterpiece. And so, in nine words, look at people, look at places, think for yourselves. And this is his shot. He spent Christmas Day in Los Angeles on this road trip, and these are the old sort of um, the old soaks that he found hanging about in downtown LA. He actually had rather a good day, I think. It was just his sort of place. He was also very lonely on this trip. But he did have Jack Kerouac on the front seat, the book. <laughs> <laughs> he did buy the influential urban sociological ideas of Jane Jacobs, above all. <coughs> and he stayed with her in New York, it turns out. Um, so that there was uh, quite a lot of uh, coming and going between them. Uh, but he had very little sympathy with Thomas Sharp's idea of, and this is from his book about town planning, um, published in 1940, and I quote, clean, proud towns of living and light, or places of a new urban order, organic, vital, clear, and logical. It was not really for men. In then at Mount Golden Lane and Churchill Gardens and the early Scandinavian influence traces of the Roehampton estate, all in the London area of this, he thought Corb could just, he thought, I should say the Corbusier, his first introduction, um, could design incredibly lovable buildings, and he specified La Tourette and the Unité. But he tripped up at the larger step, the organization of single units into towns and communities. And so, as Jonathan Meads writes neatly, Although he was not blind to modernism, he was temperamentally unsuited to it. Nan's heart lay in the accident of the city, the places where old and new might sometimes happily coexist. These things, he wrote, nail you to a place. The new towns will never have it in a thousand years. In the autumn of 1958, Nan wrote to Hugh Weldon, the ed editor of the TV arts program Monitor. Apparently, Weldon hadn't been able to find someone, this is Nan's words, hadn't been able to find someone to talk about town planning and architecture without making it sound drear. I think I might be able to do this. Could I script a program to show what I mean, showing you how, how to fit things together? If you think this idea feasible, could we perhaps discuss it in our underground pub? The architectural press, memorably, had its own basement pub, the Bride of Denmark, which in fact, uh, very soon, Nan was practically never there. He had a much preferred set of pubs um, elsewhere, where he actually worked and wrote. Weldon replied two days later, thanking him for the kind offer, but he was already trying out an architectural story, he wrote. Having watched this broadcast, Nan wrote again, as your monitor program was on Boston Manor, can I send you my feelings on it? He claimed to have been silenced by the timidity of the editors of the AR, and he wanted to sound off. And I'm just putting these up, I photographed these off a monitor in the um, BFI viewing room, so uh, hence they're not the best photographs in the world. They're just stills from uh, this monitor film. Um, and when I say stills, it was also silent because there's no track on it. Um, but I think, in fact, it was probably just a description by the architects of what they planned. On the left is what's, interestingly, you've got the view through the, um, again, through the car window um, of uh, the, the suburban area in question, and then on the right, the great plan, which I'll um, give you some little bit of detail on. Living suburb, as it was called, which was set between Boston Manor and Northfields um, two, on the tube lines of um, to the west of London, was only a the theoretical project put together by Chamberlain, Powell and Bond, the architects of Golden Lane and, to, to come, the Barbican, aided by colleagues at the GLC. Between them, Nan thundered, they had, and I quote, brought Corp's 30-year-old fallacy of buildings in landscape home to roost with a vengeance. 
The scheme was designed for 23,000 with a full range of amenities and traffic segregated below. And it presented, again I quote, a frightening spectre of formal sterility. Corbs architecture made the modern movement. <coughs> Corbs town planning could very well break it. Unless architects remember very smartly that town making is people, people in all their multiformity and idiosyncrasy. Being in a straitjacket is not better than being dead. <coughs> Weldon claimed to be horrified that your people, that is the AR editors, had not seen fit to run the piece. And he may well have been Nairn's only reader until now. This, this correspondence is, is in a brown file in the BBC archive, so it's probably never ever been heard till today. So Weldon responds um, by, by saying that he's um, horrified that the AR had sort of squelched him, but then, of course, proceeded to flannel his way out. We could not, of course, have handled anything in this way because it took us absolutely all our time to make the thing reasonably clear, to say nothing of criticising the thing afterwards. I can't tell you if they criticised it because there wasn't a soundtrack. I don't think they did. One of the difficulties of any kind of architectural story is this. This is still Weldon um, speaking. Criticism assumes a knowledge on the part of viewers, and this knowledge cannot, in fact, be assumed. However, we ought to do something else sometime. Ideas are welcome. Nairn was receiving an early lesson in damage avoidance, corporate style. Weldon, it appears from the letters on file at the BBC, always considered Nairn to be a loose cannon. Nairn took to the sky whenever he could, often with, with Bill Toomey, the architectural press's in-house photographer. Here they are. Love this picture. <laughs> Nairn on the left, Toomey on the right. <clears throat> he wrote about one shambolic expedition in the Not Architecture column of the Architects' Journal, piloting a Percival Prentice plane borrowed from the Surrey and Kent Flying Club, Club at Bigham Hill. They proceeded north from Newcastle to Edinburgh, flying very low between heavy cloud cover by identifying the B roads below. On this occasion, Toomey opted to go home at the first opportunity. <laughs> but despite the privileged insights provided by an overhead view, Nan was acutely aware of how easily the ground, seen from the air, could become nothing more than a sterile architectural model, leading to a cord like detachment from reality. During the 1960s, Nan began to loosen his ties with the Architectural Review and its eccentric editor and proprietor, Hastings, and moved into broadsheet journalism, successively the Daily Telegraph, The Observer, which he joined in 1964, as our roving correspondent on architecture and planning, listing his hobbies as continual travel, flying, and beer. And finally, The Sunday Times. He also built up his publishing and um, broadcasting careers. But it was journalism that kept him on the move, paid him well, and in fact the Sunday Times paid him far too well in the view of many, and was perhaps precipitated what happened, um, and helped him, uh, of course, find new topics for broadcasting. And it was around now that Pevsner recalled this earlier correspondence that I quoted from um, back in 1954, and turned to Nan for help despite, or perhaps because of, a review of the County Durham volume in which Nairn had identified an unresolved ambiguity, inventory or guidebook, scholarly historicism or inspired demonstration of beauty. What should these books be? <coughs> and it was for him to attempt a synthesis, uh, and with that he embarked on the Surrey volume, book for Pesner, the, the Surrey volume of the Buildings of England. By the time he was working on Sussex, however, he admitted to defeat. He was defeated by the mountain of correspondence and detailed checking. Even with his second wife, Judy, as his editor, Nairn could not face the scholarly rigor that followed an enjoyable jaunts. Pevsner wrote in the introduction that Nairn, I quote, takes a more personal and less correct view of architecture than he, but shows, again a quote, a greater sensibility to landscape and townscape and writes better than I could ever hope to write. He adds dryly and rather sweetly, those who want something a little more catalogy and are fervently interested in mouldings and such like details may find my descriptions more to their liking. <laughs> Alec Clifton Taylor quoted this in a review and added, as he could afford to, being Pevsner's most stalwart friend, 
But Pepsma is inclined to tell us everything about a building except whether it's worth going to see. As for men, more subjective, occasionally perverse, and sometimes less impeccable, never leaves us in any doubt about this aspect. In West Sussex, as in Surrey, his little vignettes conveying the essence of a place in a few lines are a source of continual delight, sometimes pungent, sometimes tender, always discerning. Nairn's finest book is undoubtedly Nairn's London, although the pieces from the listener, in my view, run it close. And it was in Nairn's London that I, in my generation, first encountered him. Imagine an academic architectural historian describing St. Stephen Walbrook in the middle of the city as God's crossword puzzle. But Nan considered that his job was to render back what I have felt and enjoyed to try and make the interpretation into some kind of poem itself, the critic acting as performer of a score. No scholarly cataloguer he. The Industrial North was among at least four stillborn companion volumes advertised to, to follow Nairn's <coughs> London and Nairn's Paris, both which were published, but they were never delivered. He shifted at this point to television, working without scripts, adding to the difficulties of those working with him, I believe. And the new direction, of course, required far less fact-checking and considerably less sustained effort than the old one. So let me take you back to the city that tested his responses to the limit, and indulged them, let's say. Nowhere drew him more strongly, nailed him as he would have it, to the urban, the Newcastle upon Tyne. Like a doting parent, over the years he watched the city aspire, then fail, then turn and surprise him, by default exposing a measure of his own political naivety. He described Newcastle in terms both historically informed, yet viscerally de dri driven. <clears throat> the way in which the city had struggled up, over, and down the gorge in which it was set induced what he was to call a kind of topographical ecstasy. Pesner, in the Northumberland Builders of England, which was written in 1955 but only published in 1957, having a hiatus because of a funding crisis, had offered a cool, factual description of the city. It was Durham, in particular the cathedral, that brought out the, pebs, the poetry in Persona, or the poet in Persona. In his 1960 listener piece with which I opened this talk, Nairn suggested that Newcastle had long been becalmed and was on, brink, on the brink of a major change. Quote, many things have to be done quickly. What happens now, whether the city adds to its potential or stamps on it, is up to the architects, the clients, and the city planning officer. But anything new must add to the polyphony, not erase it and replace it with banality. He thought a miniature barbican around the All Saints Church might be a good start. Then he moved on to the legacy of restraint, as he called it, of Granger and Dobson's work. Grandeur without pomposity, formal and firmly urbane, but not oppressive. There are a few set pieces but their masterstroke was a very clever, very subtle superimposition of a new pattern on the old. It never palls. He concludes, this is, or could be, one of the great cities of Europe. It needs a client as far-seeing as Granger, and the natural choice is the corporation itself. The new men at City Hall, this is 1960, must have been delighted. And I just learned that in November 1960, T. Dan Smith was named Man of the Year by the Architects Journal for his progressive influence on the town planning of Newcastle. Now, if that wasn't done by Ian Nairn, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> T. Dan Smith, leader of the council, for all his personalised number plates and appetite for luxury, a convinced man of the left, aspired to bring as much of the city centre as possible into public ownership. Wilfred Burns, involved in the major reconstruction of post-war Coventry, had been appointed by him to the new post of city planner, the first such in the country, and he signalled his intentions clearly. The city centre must cater to the maximum extent possible to car traffic. A civil engineer turned planner, Burns intended a virtually new centre within a short period. 
Nairn's listener pieces appeared later in book form as Britain's Changing Towns, each with a postscript written in 1967. Newcastle was on the cover. Ah, sorry, that is. <coughs> which told its own story. Nairn was, he wrote in the preface, now, this is, so this is seven years after the uh, original <coughs> piece, older, fatter, and very much sadder about the prospect of a proper modern architecture, and even more so about the capabilities of modern architects. This is apropos of Newcastle. Compared to his remarks on Cardiff and Glasgow, he was, however, surprisingly measured about Newcastle, observing that Burns has certainly engineered a revolution in Newcastle's centre, and yet paradoxically has ensured that nothing can yet be seen by freezing planning permissions for two years whilst he prepared his plans. The demolition of Eldon Square is a pity, but at least the new design will be a Bayano Jakobsen. But City Hall, which was complete by then, is not heartening at all, literal nullity, without virtues or vices. Interesting new things, in his view, were confined at present to the university site, and he specified really Whitfield Stu Students' Union and the quiet brown brick quadrangle of Richard Shepherd's mathematics building. Meanwhile, of course, by 1967, Labour had lost control of the council, and T. Dan Smith had moved to the wider Economic Development Council of the North. In 1970, in the television series Nairn in Europe, several British cities were set against comparable European examples. Produced by his regular colleague John Mappelbeck, who's here tonight, Newcastle was twinned with the Danish town of Aarhus. To see Ian Nairn on film is to be reminded of quite another era when shambling, awkward figures, and John Betchman was hardly more elegant, could be happily unleashed on the viewing public. Despite the continual misgivings of the controllers, for 10 years, Nairn was an unpredictable rough diamond who at best provided extraordinary insight, even poetry, on air, and was, like Betchman, a television natural of sorts. And now I'm going to attempt to start the film. It should last about five minutes. It is in color, but the color's gone. <laughs>
you talk about it in the abstract, and what a terrible thing to do. But it works because now you've got the two levels of Newcastle there at once. Medieval Newcastle and Railway Newcastle. And the same thing goes right through to the medieval city clustering around the water. Then came Granger and Dobson. And now we hope the 20th century is going to end its bit. And the part of Newcastle that most needs something doing very quickly is the area that slopes steeply down the river. The part that's got the chairs running through it, these great sequences of narrow staircases running between walls, formerly running between walls that belonged to houses. was already in a bad way, oh, well before the war. About 1960, when they were first really talking about revitalizing Newcastle, there was still just one or two people Hanging on living, one or two shops, the little hairdresser shop on one chair. But despite all the good intentions, absolutely nothing new has been built here in the last 10 years. There are plans, there are plenty of them, but nothing has actually gone up. And meanwhile, the very few old buildings are getting in a worse and worse condition. Some are really desperate now. I'm afraid that if it goes on much longer, the structure will be so bad they're going to have to clear the whole lot and start again. If the hillside had been filled in with modern houses, not completely, but patched in with the old ones, it would have had a marvelous place. And it is a couple of houses under the high level bridge on the very last lake. One of those two is probably unique in England, I should think. It's a four story half timber building, still with its loading crane, still really used in its medieval purpose. The great force of this part of Newcastle is just like the rest of them. You can see all the layers going on simultaneously. article for the listener in that film, <coughs> city hall politics and planning had led Newcastle on merry dance, eventually climaxing in the prosecutions in the P Pulson affair, and serving to discredit even Smith and Burns' most admirable aspirations for their city. Nairn had written a pugnacious letter to the listener in, back in 1962, I quote, a plague on any house, right, left, or center, that puts a political program before specific events and specific solutions. What I want is not anarchy, he was often typified as an anarchist, but an intelligent, flexible, and humane consideration of each issue, regardless of party politics. Now, in 1970, his enthusiasm for the key figures and their works of renewal in Newcastle had been replaced by disillusion. His culpable political and even professional innocence laid bare. Gateshead, of course, had been much had been far quicker off the start, starting blocks, cutting through the fabric with intrusive road schemes, and defining a new centre with Tynegate and Trinity Square, the work of the underson Robbie Gordon, who is now properly celebrated by Jonathan Meads in his recent book, in his new book, I should say. Um, but Robbie Gordon, Gordon, who was within Owen Luda's practice. Nairn consistently admired his work, especially the tricorn in Portsmouth and Eros House, Catford. Yet he wrote surprisingly little about Gateshead. For him, I think, it was overshadowed completely by Newcastle. Nairn's mission was to spread the message about the North, mostly by broadcasting now. Wigan, where almost 10 years earlier, he had in a somewhat surreal episode taken part in a radio walkabout for young listeners with John Summerson, he described as a city, as a town, both various, turbulent, and robust, and definitively not polite and pretty, his kind of town. 
He challenged television viewers, especially Londoners, who think that savages start out of Barnet, to follow in his footsteps along Merseyside and look again at Liverpool, the most poetic and atmospheric of England's provincial cities. In print, in an Observer piece, he argued against the mania for sandblasting the soot off stone buildings and pleaded that in Newcastle at least, Dobson Central Station and Dobson and Granger's Grey Street remained untouched as, he says, lustrous pools of darkness. That's Nairn. Nairn often returned to the Northeast for his contributions for the scene pages for the Sunday Times in the 70s. Once, following the A1 North, he stopped dead at Durham since, I quote, what has happened to Newcastle in the past 20 years is a separate story and not funny. Victorian buildings in Newcastle, the Town Hall, the YMCA, and pointing out that the demolition of much of Eldon Square, only, only permitted since Arne Jacobson's uh, hotel was to be a building of outstanding architectural merit, had been in vain. It was abandoned in favour of a speculative shopping precinct. Nor had T. Dan Smith's efforts to woo Corb to Newcastle borne fruit. Instead, Nairn was faced with Basil Spencer's distinctly underwhelming central library. Local firms such as Ryder and Yates performed better. But looking further afield, Nairn considered Tyneside was on the way to disemboweling itself with its transport plans. In November 1978, he wrote his last piece on Newcastle, and it was the second in a series of Towns in Trouble. And he'd come, he said, determined to plunge in the knife. But so help me, I can't. 
Despite the terrible things that had happened in the city in the 60s and 70s, the morale of the place is so high and the potential so great that it would be a betrayal. Who wants to get the worst over quickly? The northern end of the Tyne Bridge is a man-hating, car-loving shambles. The building that had replaced the old town hall in Big Market is an urban yob. Since whatever the limitations of the original Victorian building, it was superb townscape, just right for the space. Most of the city's alleys were in disrepair or worse, and the Eldon Square Centre had removed the earliest part of Granger and Dobson, which in the 30s had made Newcastle as fine a site as Nash's London and much better built. As John Malbec had written in the, in the Listener in 1974, Eldon Square was a particularly tragic victim of Newcastle's Brazilian pretensions. Yet the convivial evening Nan spent in Balmbras, Music Hall, followed by a good Sunday lunch in Pumphreys, blurred his critical faculties. Mystifyingly, he wrote of the crass development that faced him across Eldon Square as grander now outside than it was before. And once inside, you're part of a throbbing bazaar. Then he sobers up, arguing that no more grandiose gestures were needed. It was time to pump life back into the alleys, the stairs, and the chairs. He prescribes nothing brutal, nothing over-refined, just a slow, steady return of vitality. Pointing to the buzz of the Sunday market along the quayside, he ends, this place has kept its spirit intact against all odds. But he was too jaded, in fact too ill, to look beyond what he already knew. He ignored the work of good local practices such as Nat Barrington, and most inexplicably, Ralph Erskine's redevelopment of Biker, especially the community involvement that chimed so well with his ideas, intelligent, flexible, and humane, and forming a new neighborhood of character and individuality. On form, Nair's writing and broadcasting career, and the shot on the right has taken off um, his leads to Scotland um, uh, film, it's a two-part film which you can get on YouTube, and I do recommend it. There's a wonderful bit, particularly he, he analyzes one of the Dale's villages, I think it's called Dent, and it's just a masterly little, little section. Quite a lot of it's about railways and trains, and he's actually driving a train on that still. <coughs> However, um, his, his, um, his writing and broadcasting career had actually only <coughs> spanned about two, two decades at, in, in on form. And in 1967, well short of 40, Nan had reassured himself that, and I quote, so far, my responses have not started to fade. My only wish is to stay truly alive until I'm clinically dead. His literary heroes did not su suggest that middle age was <coughs> the prospect. And I quote, so here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, wrote T.S. Eliot. George, Ed <coughs> George Orwell died before reaching 50. Brendan Behan, at 41, was described as a, quote, drinker with a writing problem. And those words came to fit Nan all too well. His last stumbling piece for the Sunday Times was published in November 1981, almost two years before his death. <coughs> Cyril Connolly, in The Unquiet Grave, another of Nan's Bibles, written when he was 40, set the bar high. The more books you read, the sooner we perceive that the true function of a writer is to produce a masterpiece, and that no other task is of any consequence. There is little doubt in my mind that Nairn's London was that masterpiece, but I would suggest that his view of Newcastle, a long-running account of a deep love affair in print and on film, ran it pretty close. Thank you. I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, have we got the... Oh, <laughs> I sounded too close to someone. Um, have we got the microphones for the questions? Yeah, okay. Great stuff. So, please. Um, may I just ask? I've never really known much. <laughs> Sorry, if you can just wait for the microphone, it's coming. Uh, may I just 
just ask whether you feel that men, I feel a bit reluctant to say this as we are in broadcasting and so on, <coughs> but his so-called love affair of Newcastle was perhaps something that was helping his career along. So I would like to quote something you quoted, the rain you have in Newcastle. Now that might simply be you have as a sort of rather than saying one has, he seems to distance himself a little bit. Um, the love affair is perhaps something which was he focused on Newcastle, but personally he may not have had so much of a love affair. Well, I, I, I mean, he <coughs> comes back and back and back. He's not, I mean, despite the death certificate and the statement that he was born here, he wasn't born here. Um, so he's, he's not from, from here, and of course he wrote the most astonishing amount of journalism. I mean, you know, he's, he's the box file of just the Sunday Times pieces. He's, there are just hundreds of, of pieces, and there are all sorts of places that were favorite towns and so on, and he, his hobbies were constant travel, beer and wine. You have it. I mean, he wasn't really at home anywhere. Um, he loved France, he, loved, he came to love America, um, he was all over um, the British Isles. I mean, so, but it just it struck me, uh, hardly, because of course, I'm um, invited to come for the lecture in Newcastle, that it was a continual strand in his journalism, broadcasting, and everything. And certainly the North, unlike, you might have put the whole North together, but it was the sort of, and he, and he would have done another of those books on you know, Nairn's Industrial North, because he was. But it was a romantic thing. I mean, it was mostly, it, it was, I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, he was a drinker and, and, you know, he presumably had moments when, you know, he was, his emotions were hugely uh, sort of uh, you know, ebullient. And other times where perhaps, you know, he, he saw it in any way that he was in a very different light. Uh, he, was, he was just looking for poetic, um, it was something that lit the, the fuse, and at best, um, I mean, perhaps London was, was his, because that book is, is second to none, London perhaps was the great love of, of all of them, and he actually knew it, of course, uh, backwards. Um, he didn't know Paris so well. It's a very, very, it's a wonderful book, but it's absolutely shot through the mistakes and the things that he just sort of made up as he went along. Um, not quite, that's not quite. Uh, I don't quite go to your history. <laughs> 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 I just draw the attention that we get to Cameron Durham, Southwood River, if I'm allowed to speak about that Newcastle. He wrote a brilliant piece in 135, the article review in 1964, an inventory of about 60 or 70 villages. He described everything about Durham, uh, as he said, everything new. He wrote an editorial about Cammy Durham. Went to Barnum Castle and somehow missed the Bowdoin Museum. I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's draining the book. <coughs> in two years' time, it'll be the 50th anniversary of that publication, and I hope that the forces represented in this room will somehow find it in their power to persuade artists and press or whoever owns the AR copyright now to republish it because it's confined to those narrow, sugar pages, bright mustard, impossible to read, <laughs> and it deserves a much, much wider audience. It's still the finest writing we can do. Well, I have to say that, that this talk is, and I've written several essays in the last couple of years, but it's, it's all going towards some version of a celebration of Nairn uh, in book form. I mean, we have to take account of copyright, which may be a problem. I'm doing it with David Mackey, who's already been up to talk to John about the filmmaking, and he is, of course, himself a distinguished journalist. So within the bounds of the possible, we hope to be able to quote some of that. So I'd be very grateful. I mean, if you, you know, kind of had some passages which you really, I, please, please see me after. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the connections he was making between Newcastle and Arthur's 
Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry that I had to cheat you with that. Um, well, I only saw, I've only seen the film a couple of times about a year ago, but my memory is, I mean, he's, the, the bit he really likes about Orpheus is the, is the university. And, he, you know, he loved a Scandinavian modernism. You know, his, his sort of heroes were people like Eric Lyons, um, the, and the, you know, the best of the, of the Brits that looked to Scandinavia, which is one of the reasons I found it so extraordinary that he never kind of got to grips with Erskine and, and Biker. But um, he really liked the university, which is, um, I can't remember the name of who designed it. I'm sure there are people in this room who do know. Um, very, very, kind of very simple materials. It's not actually entirely modern. It's got a modernist sort of block in the middle, but it's mostly brick and very sort of expressed and, uh, and very beautifully set. The landscape's wonderful. He hated the folk village in Orpheus, and that's what it, that's the point he's making with the Royal Arcade, you know, pointlessly reconstructed in the wrong place and so on. And he's saying, um, you know, that this village is, you know, there's no one there. You know, once the tourists have gone home, they shut the gates and it's full of little cottages with not a single soul around. So he's very strong on that. Um, and the, there are other sort of general comments. I think he compares the churches, the, the sort of cathedrals, um, and, and so on. And I, this might be the moment. I really don't want to let this end without John having some comments about working with Nen, whether on this film or, or others. Um, would, would you like to say something yeah, about it all? Should I have to give John a microphone? Scene, which is that we get a, a, a comparison between um, Hamburg and Bristol. And um, he introduced the camera in Hamburg, in which he um, said how terrible it was that Hamburg had been bombed to Slytherines by an environment sort of social democratic city. He said, never welcome Hitler through his gates. And um, I, I sort of, as a producer, said to him, well, you know, come on, let this part of it. German state. He said, no, that's what I want to say. And he and I was it. So in fact, that was the piece of camera that we did. That's been the open piece. And Paul Fox, who was then the controller of BBC One, it's very interesting to hear some of the uh, uh, internal BBC controversies around here, because I became very much part of them myself. Uh, Paul Fox, who, who, had been a, who had been a paratrooper in the war, uh, took great pains to this and said the program was most unfair to Bristol and uh, demanded that I show it to the controller, to the BBC manager in Bristol, who then very decently sent me a copy of the memo he wrote, who said he thought it was a lovely program and if anything, he'd have been much too kind to Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't stop Paul Fox from not showing the film. In those days, I mean, well, maybe nowadays too. I mean, um, channel controllers in the BBC are like medieval prince things. There's no rise of appeal. I mean, that's it. The poor box wouldn't show it, he wouldn't show it. And so that's one particular there that never appeared. Um, my relationship with him began, uh, I think, about five years earlier when I was editing uh, Look North in Manchester and was looking for somewhere developing regional themes. And of course, I come across Ian's writing in The Observer and elsewhere. And um, I thought I'd like to bring an to Norfolk. Uh, I managed to get a slot. It was quite difficult in those times to get a slot. 6.15, I think we had on, on BBC One, a half an hour regionally. And the idea was that Ian would go to um, various northern towns, uh, give his view on the town, and then um, a group of local worthies would then respond in a, in a studio discussion. And uh, my most nightmarish moment ever as a BBC producer was seeing the Telly City machine regurgitating pieces of film, which I still would rather assume couldn't have anything to do with my program, because <laughs> this tension was the thing. But in fact, it was my program, the reel had come on. And so I think it was Wigan. So the various. Worthies of Wigan were asked to interview 
a, 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 a comment on a program they'd never seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember desperately the chairman saying at one point, well, if you had seen what thing you've said. <laughs> 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 Why is he going to, in the sense that uh, I saw the party candidate here very shortly after this series, really. And um, I think, in many ways, it, it does. It, it was a very, uh, it was a very uh, fundamental part of the way. So we, we've gone on personally after that quite well, but not professionally. And it, I think it really did come down to the fact that Ian really was rather, in my view, he was rather taken with T down, um, in a way that already I had put in reservations for. And I remember that when, when T down was in a curious interlude, when he was um, charged with corrupting Alderman Al uh, uh, Wandsworth, and the Wandsworth uh, Alderman had been acquitted. Uh, no, well, Alderman, well, Alderman, the, the Alderman Wandsworth was in jail, uh, but because uh, T down was Try secretary, that he was uh, found not guilty. So the poor old Alderman Watts is in, was serving time uh, for uh, taking bribes from a man who'd been found not guilty in the fine. So it was a curious, <laughs> curious time. And um, he, he came to me because I was then the sort of editor features in, in Newcastle. And um, he said, um, You know, I really like to talk about. about my life, my past, what I, my view was about what I wanted Newcastle to be. And I, I said to him, well, I mean, some of the sort of phraseology you use, you know, there's Brazil, the Venice of the North. Any regrets? He said, what do you mean? He said, have you been to Venice, John? I said, no, I haven't. I said I had. <laughs> he said, well, it's got this tight ring of canals, hasn't it? Because I said, well, it's still having something. <laughs> and he said, well, that is my inner motorway east. Now, <laughs> and I found myself laughing, and then realised I wasn't meant to laugh. <laughs> and so when my late wife and I used to be on that particular stretch, and we'd be cut in by some great tanker, I'd say, there's another gondola gondola. <laughs> anyway, that's about <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the photograph you showed. Was it Jane Jones or Joseph, the American? Jim Jacobs. Jim J Jacobs. Yes. Well, you seem to imply it might have had some dialogue with him about an understanding of the city in relation to architectural society and yes. high street and flat. She was the great uh, sort of heroine. I mean, I think she's sort of, she's been sort of rediscovered, actually, interestingly now, the death and life of, of the American, of the great American city, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, the, the pulsing life of the neighborhood and the Boston, I mean, the one of her, I mean, Philadelphia, Boston, New York. And she and her husband fought against a huge motorway scheme in, in a Robert Moses scheme in, in Manhattan, near to Manhattan, and succeeded. So, well, that was a little bit later. So she was already, she'd been on architectural forum since the 30s and was a very um, prolific architectural observer and writer. And she'd sort of swung to this view of sort of, you know, in a way, this is, you know, if you think of the, late 50s in the US and the early 60s at the moment, sort of uh, huge ambitions for, for city centres and things, and she was the, she was the voice of dissent, the, the strongest voice of dissent. And I think the fact that Ian then found himself, A, staying with her, and B, I mean, there are, there are letters on the Rockefeller Foundation files and also um, one of the other American uh, files sort of saying, you know, they both learned a lot from each other. I mean, I don't think Ian then was, not a great one for sort of saying where he'd got things from and giving credit and you know his books aren't littered with sort of uh, effusive thanks to people. Um, I think he he did use um, Jane Jacobs without very much um, acknowledgement at the beginning and then he did begin to. But she she's 
I mean, if you put him in her company, sort of in the States, that, would, that immediately puts, certainly now, and I think probably then too, it gives us a sort of, you know, he was very much keeping the right company. Um, and I, I think they, I mean, it didn't, as far as I know, they didn't correspond. I know the papers that in her collection suggest they did, but they spent time together, enough time to um, exchange views. So. I mean, I, I sort of—I was surprised because at that point I thought he was a much more sort of you know, British-focused figure, and the whole American adventure, which he summarised in one of the Sunday Times pieces, summarising all his different sort of dealings and visits to the states. Um, and in the end, he wrote one piece which he said, "You know, I've just thought about this place over and over, and I really have come." You know, he, he just loved it by the end. I think the ten-week trip was pretty tough. Um, but he, he came to sort of really enjoy it. So it, it, it just threw a different light on the way, he, what he was informed by, I suppose is what I'm saying. He was, and the interesting thing is that Gordon Cullen, with whom he worked, didn't fly. So all the work that they did in the States was, was done either with Gordon Cullen taking you know, a slow boat or just from him drawing off a man's own photographs, which are pretty good, actually. Although I think he said, I used to think his photographs were really splendid. I now think that they actually he was just copying more or less what Eric Damari did in the office. And they're really like Eric Damari's photographs, but not as good. But yeah, the point was he was using his camera and looking and noting, and it was all part of his um, um, sort of annotation. I think I can confirm that Jane Jacobs has probably been one of the few books continually on reading this since 1916, when it was actually first published. Um, and she was sort of knocked by people like Mumford, who said she was just a housewife, telling people you know, what they already knew. And you know, she, she sort of, she got quite a bad start, really. I mean, you know, she had her supporters, but she had some very powerful people against her. It's interesting, Nan um, reviews Mumford, City Mystery, um, and sort of says, I, I kind of agree with you in ways, but it's, it's an oddly critical review, and I wonder if it's, if it's partly sort of slightly shoulder to shoulder with, with her. Yes. I wish somebody could tell me why he suddenly, he, Nan said, didn't want Sharp anywhere near. <laughs> I'd love to have the explanation for that. Just say some firm. Anyone but Thomas Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got one last question here. Uh, would you say that people like Jonathan Leeds or Owen Hatherley are the uh, Ian Nairns of the present day? And if not, who is if such a beast exists? Well, I think they. I think they are. I mean, Jonathan's um, kind of his new book, Museum Without Walls, has a very nice essay, which is a version of a talk he gave to the Twentieth Century Society. But I think he's slightly changed it, um, and uh, I mean, he's a sort of thoughtful interpreter of, of Nan, and I think he's I suspect he's more and more convinced by Nan as as time passes. Own heavily. Well, Owen Hathaway has a language apart from anything else. You know, he is a real writer. Um, and although I think, I, you know, he's not always, I find him exhausting. <laughs> so, because he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the generosity in, this, in some ways that, that Nan seemed to have. You know, Nan would kind of infuse hugely about something. And he would seem so cross. But, you know, he is a great, he, you know, Owen Hathaway appears to be a great Nan sort of admirer. And you know, there is a whole new generation of people who, you know, see what, I mean, it's a combination of being able to express um, in good language and in accessible language. I mean, you know, God's crossword puzzle. I mean, extraordinary, the words that just, you know, a few words that just summon up a whole building or a whole street or whatever. And, you know, we've been a bit, I mean, Samson, of course, was, you know, peerless. And Nan too, and then there's been a long drought, I think. And um, I mean, I, I think uh, those two people are. I mean, they've assumed the mantle, but I wouldn't tear it off them either. I think, um, yeah. 
and they're passing on the word too, which is what it's all about. Let's go back and read it more. Julian, I'm sure we could be asking you questions for the whole evening, but we really ought to allow you to, to stand down. So thank you very much. It's been absolutely fascinating, wonderful, wonderful presentation, and um, I'm sure everyone will agree.